Hi there, and um, thanks for finding our video. Um, the systems at, at play um, videos are all available here, and I hope you enjoy them. Uh, on the 25th of November, 2021, we had the, the Systems Thinking Fishbowl event, which was our last event for the year. Uh, we had a really good turnout and we had some great speakers and some really good conversation. Our speakers or people in the panel, I should say, were Joan Lurie, Pauline Roberts, Brian Hopkins and Luke Craven. We were also joined surprisingly by Jean Dunninger as well, which was a great treat. Uh, Systems at Play has been around for a while. Uh, we're growing and we're now at 255 members across all of the continents except Antarctica, 21 countries and 48 cities. Uh, why are we around? Well, we're here because we uh, want to respond to the dominant reductionist ways of thinking. Not that these are invalid, but there are other ways to think. And also the, um, we wanted to explore the vast ocean that is uh, all of the systems thinking sort of schools as well dipping our toe in it and learning more and more as we go. And it became our passion. We actually want to share this with everyone and learn together as well. So in, the, in addition to the uh, four speakers that we have today uh, in the recording, we in the past 12 months, we also had Paul uh, Zonneveld and uh, Tracy Benson. Unfortunately, they were not able to um, be here uh, on, the, on the evening. And it was a fantastic uh, uh, year with pretty much every two months, we had a brilliant speaker uh, on a topic uh, for the meetup. So we hope to uh, continue with this tradition at, at least for the next year. Um, next slide also, what we did in the past 12 months is have a, a you know, couple of workshops, a um, couple of training sessions, and also cross meetup uh, events. So it's quite good that you know, we had a vast uh, interaction with our uh, community and other communities as well, cross meetup community. So this is the uh, our YouTube YouTube channel when you are on and uh, we hope you'll subscribe. So um, most of the events in our community are for free. Um, however, having said that, we need to also support organizations that um, develop and grow the system thinking ideas. One of those communities is Watcher Center. And as a result of that, we decided to nominate them as our charity of choice for this event. So we really appreciate if you can uh, donate something to their, to their cause, uh, either use the QR code or the link di uh, directly and your funding will be will go towards supporting the creation of digital free cards of habits of system thinkers in other language. They're fantastic cards. I've used them a lot, and it would be wonderful if we can support um, expansion of those ideas. Enjoy the session. Uh, we hope to see you next year, and thanks for your support and in the last 12 months. Okay. Thank you. So um, again, my name is Ali Dal Hamidi with Michal and, and, and Dave on the call. The three of us founded this community, but um, we are really just the hosts of the community. We don't own the community. The community belongs to you. We're just serving you guys and create, trying to create this space. So with that, I uh, will stop sharing my screen so we can move into that immersive view um, there you go so what what we will um, what what we will ask the um, panelists to do is to introduce yourself maybe just to make it easy we start from um, Luke um, on the right and then I'll just move to the left and then Joan and, and Pauline and Brian uh, and then you have around one minute to introduce yourself and then you start asking the questions. Thanks, Ali, Dan, and, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Luke Craven. Um, I'm a Canberra-based strategic designer and systems practitioner. Uh, and really the question that has animated all of my career is how can we support people to think and work in systemic ways? And I've tackled that question from, from various angles, including as an academic, uh, most recently as a public servant, uh, in my current role, I do a lot of work supporting uh, local communities and local organizations to do place-based systems change work. Thanks, Luke. Welcome.
Oh, you are on mute. Um, my dog's snoring behind me, so I thought best to put it on mute while you were talking, Elida. Um, my name is Joan Lurie. I am the founder of Organomics. It's a um, systemic change consultancy, but also a methodology for um, complex organizational systems. And I think, you know, like Luke, I, I've spent the last 30 years really being um, deeply curious about how we can grow a systemic lens in um, for leaders, but also deep curiosity in organizational systems, particularly what are they, how do they function, and how do we bring about change in them? Um, so yeah, delighted to be here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Pauline Roberts. Um, I'm based in the UK and I'm a systems practitioner. Um, I've worked in private industry and public service uh, and I've suddenly disappeared from the fishbowl. There I am back. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Um, my uh, biggest issue that I have a lot of the time is that people come across systems thinking and then they can't translate it into the context of their own work or the, the arenas in which they are working. And what tends to happen is then we lose people from the world of systems thinking because they just give up, they find it too hard. So I spend a lot of my time trying to find ways to make it easy for people um, to get a grip on it, to put it into reality. And so that we don't lose people who are interested and um, they've got to be able to, to you know, fit it to their context. And I focus quite heavily on that in the UK. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, by the way, I think uh, for some reason your video is, um, I don't know, freezing. If you can uh, stop the streaming and uh, start again, that might help. Um, okay. Oh, Pauline just disappeared. That's uh, um, Okay, Brian, over to you. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brian Hopkins. I'm based in Sheffield in the United Kingdom just a few miles, not, not, not that far away from Pauline, actually. Um, I work as a learning and development consultant, uh, primarily with international organizations. And I've been using systems thinking in my work for uh, the last, I guess, last 20 years or so. Um, I'm interested in not only using systems thinking to actually, as part of my professional practice, to strengthen the learning and development services that I offer, but also to try to work in uh, learning about systems thinking in any program that I'm actually working on. So that's me. Welcome, Brian. Thank you so much. I know it's early in the morning. I know it's uh, late afternoon here in Australia. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I'll just send everyone it's else. Cold, it's cold and dark in the UK, I tell you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If there, if there is any consolation, it is um, raining here in Sydney, so it doesn't feel like it's summer at all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, maybe I'll just kick off the um, the fishbowl with a question, and then um, you guys can see how it will look like, and then we will open up. You know, everyone, um, please start asking your question. What I'll do, I'll type in my name and the question that I have. And then I will read through the question. So as I am asking the question, um, I will bring myself into uh, into the panel. And my question is, knowing what you know now, what would you change? Or would you change anything about how you started system thinking? Um, who wants to start first? I'll, I'll offer something. Um, I... <clears throat> I, I played, I started, I first learned about systems thinking in a very kind of vague way back in the early 90s. And um, I didn't really do very much with it because I couldn't figure out how to incorporate it into my practice. But then in about 2010, I was uh, working for a, a, a UN agency and I was asked to run a session on systems thinking for a group of senior managers, directors, director level, very senior people. And so I thought, well, I'll run a session on system dynamics and using system dynamics in order to um, understand the dynamics of a humanitarian intervention. And I met with an incredibly hostile reception from uh, these directors who said, 
because this is what I was doing was very simplistic, naive. They knew how to do everything much better. Um, and it was a complete waste of time. And some of them got up and walked out of the room. But <clears throat> at the end of the session, uh, a, a significant number of people came up and apologized for the behavior of their senior managers and said, oh, that was the most interesting thing they'd done in the entire workshop. So I thought, whoa, this is an interesting subject systems thinking. It really kind of pisses some people off. Um, so I, when I got back to my flat, I, um, I looked up the Open University, found a systems thinking course and registered for a master's in systems thinking, which I then spent the next seven years studying. Um, um, but where that this story has taken me is that actually um, systems thinking has still got the capacity to really alienate many people. Uh, and I think uh, what I have learned now and what is still resonant resonates with my early experiences of systems thinking was that it's often something which is best done uh, under the radar that uh, you can you can use systems thinking, but like with Fight Club, you don't talk about systems thinking. So kind of an interesting dynamic. I noticed uh, Gene Bellinger in the audience and uh, this was something he said in a webinar that he delivered for the Open University a month or so ago. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, Gene, for backing me up on that. That's me. Oh, Ali Dad. Okay. Sorry, I want to mute. Thanks. I, I'm happy to riff off that, Ali Dad, because I think um connects to something that Pauline said earlier as well, which is I think one of the misplaced assumptions about systems thinking or complexity work is that it can't be simple. It can't be made or shaped in a way that um, it's going to resonate easily with people that might not have deep exposure or experience to it. Uh, and they can, they'll be able to apply it in their daily practice. And I think I've had the experience of being a, a systems thinking academic and, and being part of quite esoteric, cerebral, amorphous conversations about systems work that's, you know, had in the, in the spheres of research and academia. And then as a practitioner, trying to support people to take those conversations and make them real to people. Um, I think the other, the other thing for me is um, I wish I had known or expected people to be so dogmatic about particular approaches or methods in the world of systems. Uh, I think often you'll hear conversations that reference systems thinking being a very broad church or a diverse collection of methods and frameworks and approaches. I think occasionally the community itself is too siloed and adversarial um, across those boundaries. Um, and so I, I wish uh, sometimes we'd have conversations more about you know, how we hold our own tools lightly uh, rather than dogmatically. Mm. That resonates a lot for me. Um, did you want to go, Holly? No, you go, Joan. I'm fine. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that uh, how I came to systems thinking, which I'm really grateful for, is that I was a participant in a systemic change program. And so I saw the deep impact really practically of a systemic approach as a participant uh, in a two and a half day program um, where there was really one lecture in the whole program talking about some core underpinning principles. And I've spent the rest of the time um really filling in from an academic and theoretical viewpoint and i i think that is one of the most um, important things for us to consider as practitioners is not to be um, attached to necessarily theoretical positions or methodology but help people experience the magic of it and how practical it can be um, and i you know i, I think that because I had that first-hand experience um, and that was the beginning of my journey, I try and connect people to the systemic way of thinking and approaches in a very similar way 
because I think that is such a helpful way in if you can find a meaningful connection in the context that people are in rather than introduce it in a theoretical sense. Um, and, you know, I think we as practitioners should just get over ourselves and all the fights and all the attachment. I mean, the paradox that we have in our field around attachment and not being able to hold multiple perspective um, to our own methods is, you know, it's paradoxical and ironic, actually. So I really uh, resonate with what you're saying about that. Yeah. Probably an adaptive challenge for our field, actually. <laughs> Thanks, John. Pauline, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't change a thing about how I got started in systems thinking because I started in um, pharmaceutical industry, um, specials manufacturing, and we had consultants after consultants after consultants coming in um, to make us better. And I saw the mess that it created and the absolute disasters that it created. And actually I was using systems thinking at the time and thinking I do something really different and I'm not creating the mess that they're creating. So what's happening here? And like Brian, I went looking for something that was more academic in the field of what I was doing because I didn't really know what it was called. And then I found the undergraduate systems thinking and really got to grips with that at an undergraduate level. Um, and then I moved into public services and moved on to doing uh, the MSc in systems thinking. And at the time I had as much autonomy as I liked because I had quite a senior position. I could, And I went out there and I just tried it. And I tried everything that they were trying to teach us in the courses. And I tried it and got loads of it wrong, absolutely wrong, crashed around like a complete newbie. But that really made it embed with me what makes it work and what makes it not work and why people have the reactions that they do towards systems thinking and how we need to deal with those and how we can incorporate it into our daily work without creating the hostility like Brian mentioned you sometimes come up against those barriers it really pisses people off um, how do you do it without doing that and that you know I started in the place where yeah it got everybody's backs up but it taught me so much about how you put this into practice that I wouldn't change a thing it was a turbulent journey and I'm really happy I had it thank you so much Pauline I'm I'm thanks to everyone that was so inspirational and lots of good insight since I asked the question I need to also contribute um there is so much I want to say when I started my my journey but I think the number one thing that come to my mind now uh, after hearing everything you say, I I started too late to reach out and ask for help about system thinking, and I waited too long. I said I need to know everything before I talk to some of these thought leaders or practitioners or, or people well known in the community because I will embarrass myself. You know, they will know I don't know nothing and they won't help me. And I saw it quite the contrary. As soon as I started to reach out to any one of you. Um, I got a lot of insights and, and, and support. And I think this is one of the things that I see in the system thinking community. It's quite supportive and everyone wants to actually open up and most people, not everyone, but and, and help you and, and hold your hands to find your way. So my, my thing is, if I start all over again, I'll go back, I'll reach out to folk, folks like yourself much sooner. And I will start a community with my, my friends and colleagues much sooner. So. Thank you so much. I will get out of the chair. And I think, uh, Roma, you asked the first question. I'll bring you down to the uh, to here, uh, ask your question. What I'll also do is let me just move Pauline up. And because Pauline, you're free, frozen here, let me see if it can work, right? So I, I will just do this and I'll bring you back to the chair quickly. Hopefully this will work. If it didn't, um, I apologize. This is uh, technology. We didn't expect this to happen. Okay, Roma, over to you. Ask your way. Thanks, Aladar. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here uh, amidst the, the great people in the community. Uh, my question is very basic. When you start with systems thinking or when you see people around you are not using that systems thinking lens, how do I inspire myself as well as those around me to adopt that lens more or try to make it as a habit? What would you advise? Let's see. 
who would like to start? I'm happy to start, Ali Dad. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't Oh, I seem to be moving around chairs a lot, don't I? I mean, I would say try not to make it too overwhelming. Small things are good enough. We've, we've all got to start somewhere. Um, and I think with, with a lot of people that I come across, they find it too overwhelming and too big and the field is too huge to get to grips with. But small steps get people started and find the things that help motivate them. So... The things that I found motivate people and motivate myself is when I can show them that I understand something from their point of view. So the systems thinking helps me to see a situation in a way that I can not just look through my eyes, but other people's eyes as well. Now, when I show people how I can do that, it motivates them because it shows them that I understand the challenges that they have got. So even just that, being able to see things through a number of different people's eyes, um, even like learning that skill can get people on board because they can suddenly see things differently to how they saw them before. So I think my advice, uh, rumor is start small and don't expect that you have to do it all right at the very beginning. Pick up on a few small things, get people to grips with them and then move them along gently. Um, if it shows that it can change their mindset just ever so slightly and it's beneficial for them, then that works for them. And an example I had recently, I talked to somebody about how we, we reframe things, how you can reframe things so that you look at them very differently. And a woman I was working with went into a meeting and she said, I tried that out. I did it. I just said to them in the meeting, can I just stop you a minute and do this from a different perspective? She totally reframed the question that they were trying to work with. And she came out absolutely beaming. She said, that worked. That really worked. And we had a completely different uh, conversation. So she wanted to know more then. So it really inspired her to, to get to grips. So I would say, start small um, and work from there and don't overwhelm yourself in the early stages. Oh. Thank you, Pauline. Yeah, maybe I'll pick up from Pauline because I, I think what's really, uh, in my experience, um, uh, absolutely agree with Pauline. Start with them. Don't don't start with something that's too big and too complex. Because um, I think the most important thing is if they can make some connection to themselves and potentially to their role or how they are seeing. So even drawing attention to their own map and their own frame um, is you know very liberating. I think as a starting point. Uh, the other thing that I find is really helpful are stories and examples, uh, really simple stories and examples which kind of show interconnection or circularity, which they can really relate to from whatever roles that they get to play or from their context. So if you can bring in stories that are meaningful to their context or to their role and um, stories that they can relate to, I find that that is a really helpful way in stories or, or um, examples. And another thing that I think is really helpful are, you know, questions that get them to make new connections, create new information for themselves, uh, make distinctions, and um, they're beautiful questions that you can ask, which help them to sort of make, um, and to frame and get new understanding and new insights. Um, through, through those questions. So those are three things I, I would recommend. I might just come in on the tail there um, because I, I think uh, one of the things that I do as well is try to help people identify where they are already using systems thinking tools or practices, perhaps without even noticing it or naming it in that way. Um, I think sometimes the way that people are introduced to this content is that it's completely new. It's a new lens that they need to buy into or apply to their work. And yet there are countless examples of where people use things that we would think of as um, system driven or complexity driven ways of making sense of the world around them. As simple as getting into a car and driving to the shops, right? Where we have to be paying attention to our environment thinking through connections at multiple degrees of, of removal. Um, so I think like those, those examples make people see that this is something that they already do, often in their daily lives, but we've built 
kind of organizational contexts that are inhospitable to those ways of, of thinking. So just kind of breaking that boundary for people and seeing that they have the tools and practices, I think can be quite liberating. Um, I think the second thing that I, I do a lot is work with metaphor, which I think is quite quite similar to working with, with story. Um, and so in the, in the health context, there's been some really interesting research done about how you bring health practitioners into conversations about the social determinants of health and think about the systems that sit behind well-being. And the two metaphors that really resonate quite heavily across diverse groups are kind of systems as ecologies. Um, and, you know, people understand what an ecosystem is. They can apply it as a metaphor to many of the contexts that they live and work in. And then the second is an energy grid, um, which is, you know, limiting and enabling in different ways, but is a foundation again for conversations about the way that systems operate and how they can be applied to different contexts. If I'm um, trying to sort of work some more systems thinking into a situation and to help people to understand how to actually get going with it, is I say, well, actually, let's just let's, uh, let's draw draw a picture of it. So I pick up a piece of paper and say, well, so who's involved in this? What what are their relationships? And draw a rich picture or something like that. Um, not about it being a kind of systems thinking tool. But just as a as a way of actually trying to capture the, the 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 complexity of what is actually going on and what they're talking about, um, draw a rich picture with you know little stick figures of people who are contributing, people who are involved, um, and then then once you've got some sort of starting point on that, then I think it makes it easier to introduce. What I see is the sort of the, the three foundational principles of systems thinking about boundaries, perspectives and relationships, because you can look at your picture and you can say, well, OK, so um, so this this person here, how would they see this situation? Would they draw the same picture? Would they add something else? Would they leave something out? Would they make certain features of it more prominent? Uh, what's the connection? What's, what are the relationships between these people here? You know, is, is it a good relationship? Is it a bad relationship? Is it a non-existent relationship where it should be a relationship? And then the boundaries issue is to, well, who, who's, who's here? Who's not here? Why have we made those decisions? Um, so I think, you know, drawing pictures is a really good way of actually getting people introduced to the idea of systems thinking without really telling them that you're doing systems thinking. Wow. <laughs> so Thank Roma, you. back to you. Did you like to, would you like to contribute before we move to the next question? Did you want to add? Uh, that was, thank you, Ali Dad, and thank you everyone. That was really insightful and useful. Such simple things, but really, but things that can make a huge impact. All right, thank you. Thanks for a, such a wonderful question. Um, the next question is from Ed, but before I um, I move Ed down here in the in the panel, and Ed, um, I think you're ready. Um, guys, um, we have a question from Ed, and then there is no other question. So please, if you have any question, either 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 if it's a new question or related to the conversation that we, we've been having, um, please um, ask away. Type it in the in the chat, and we will bring you into the panel. I think we lost Pauline. Uh, let's see what happened there. Yeah, I think we did. Okay, let's continue, and I'm sure she will join. Um, all right, Ed. Thank, thanks, Ali. Um, I just positioned myself on the seat. <laughs> it's looking very weird. <laughs> um, so I I've worked in large enterprises for far too many years. Um, and I'm in, a, I'm in an agile, agile coach role, so very much to do with transformation. Um, however, I'm, I'm very aware of the dangers of um, either ignoring complexity or trying to eliminate it. Um, and systems thinking, I think, is a wonderful approach, but I think there's a danger that it can be misapplied. Um, especially around this concept of legibility. So big organizations love to measure everything. 
document everything. Everything turns into a KPI and a dashboard and all the rest of it. Um, and as a, as a coach in that space, that, that's something that I um, have to wrestle with quite, you know, quite almost daily. Um, I'm just very curious about the panel's experience in this space, your thoughts, um, your wisdom on the matter of how can we avoid this trap of making complex systems legible and hence eliminating its sort of richness and inherent complexity that has, that has value in it. That's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to go first, Ed, because at one level, I think the answer is we can't eliminate that challenge. I think it's a, a challenge inherent in any form of sense making, not just systems thinking. Um, and I think often in conversations about systems thinking, reductionism is kind of positioned as, a, as an evil or something that we need to avoid in the way that we approach a problem. I tend to see reduction not as a limit to sense making, but as something that enables it, right? So anytime we try and make sense of an issue, we are stripping back layers of complexity, even if we are drawing a systems map or having a conversation that reflects the principles of, of systems thinking and complexity. So at, at one level, I think we just have to hold that limit. And, and recognize that the human tendency is always towards legibility um, and that we need to recognize that that has risks and dangers and kind of hold, hold our tools lightly. An alternative answer to that question um, and some on the line will be familiar with, with Mike Jackson and his work on critical systems thinking. So Mike's emerging answer to this question is that um, one of the routes to avoid the trap of legibility is to use multiple frameworks in tandem. Um, so how do we bring different systems frameworks and sense-making frameworks together so that no single one of them tells the complete story of legibility? And actually having them in parallel enables conversations about different perspectives and gaps and some of those really inherent limits. Um, but I think it's... I think it's a bit of a baby with the bathwater argument to say, how do we stop making, how do we get, get away from the trap of making things legible? Um, I think a better way to position that question is to say, acknowledging that as a limit, what should we do? Yeah, I really like that. Um, and I, I think one of the principles that I work with a lot um, is the idea that you know, never make part of the system bad or wrong um, because you invite in some circular way a resistance or a defensiveness. So I think to work with multiple perspective and multiple possibility and help people work with distinction rather than, um, you know, removal is a much more helpful way to scaffold people into moving themselves away from certain things rather than um, making them bad or wrong and having to reject it and give it up. So I, I think that's a really important principle. And I, I think what Mike Jackson is talking about is very important because I think it speaks to our principles of being able to hold um, complexity in itself and the multiplicity of that. But I think most importantly, not to make anything necessarily bad or wrong as a starting point but rather let people discover those distinctions and how they sit in relation to each other is a very helpful way in. Yeah, I think it's useful to, um, you know, sort of to, uh, to think about the, uh, you know, the idea of a, of a wicked problem that actually, you know, we can never really define exactly what is going on in any particular situation. Um, everybody will have a different idea about it and actually it's probably changing all the time anyway. So when we're working in a situation such as you're you're thinking about here, Ed, I think, I think you know all that is all we can realistically do at any one time is to do one or two things, uh, and um, to have some idea as to whether we're progressing in that one thing. But I think the important thing is to actually remain re re 
remember the bigger picture remember the what we're trying to achieve as a sort of a, as a as an overall result we're trying to make something better in some way uh and to think well is this one thing that i'm focusing on at the moment is this actually making the big picture better uh i mean the problem we have in with kpis and things like that is they become an end in themselves is that um you know you have a health system which is failing so you have a, a target for meeting sort of waiting times in accident and emergency departments so that becomes you know that, that becomes you know a measure of how the whole health system is working is whether or not people have been sort of shifted through a and e departments more quickly and and that that's that's the problem is that actually if we if we find that actually that target is not being achieved if the health system is still struggling or still getting better irrespective of what is happening with that indicator then we actually think well let's 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 shift our focus to something else so in itself i don't think sort of focusing on one issue is is bad but it's when it becomes our sort of our uh, our raison d'etre that's the problem yeah and i think i'd come in with saying pretty much like luke and john that it, it's something we can't really avoid but there are there is a different way to look at the situation to expose other things and i use multiple kind of methodologies methods approaches all of the time and i think it's really key to do that so that you get a wide span of view of different elements of the system and what other things are there um and I don't think it can be avoided absolutely completely because like I think it was Luke who said it's part of our nature to do that but to show that something else is also there then that exposes people to such different options different options for them and I think yeah I don't think we can avoid it completely just just to add one final thought um which is that I I, I think this challenge of how we bring like multiple methods and perspectives together is something that you know, obviously we don't want to codify it to the ends of the earth, but I think it's an area of um, systems practice which is quite tacit um, and different practitioners use different ways of doing that in the work that they do. Um, I think, you know, Mike is trying to articulate some of that in his approach to, to critical systems practice, but I think there's value in conversations about how different people approach this. Um, because it is, I think, as we, as people become more experienced systems practitioners, it is a skill that they hone. Uh, and there's, there's value in actually exploring what that looks like. Yeah, I agree with that, totally. Thank you. And, and, and Ed, thanks for asking that wonderful question. Did you want mm. to, was there anything you would like to contribute to the discussion? Uh, that was super helpful. Um, <laughs> I really put my head in a completely different space, which was what I was really hoping for. And I love the idea of using redu reductionism as an enabler. That's kind of such a great flip, a 180. Um, and also that whole idea of multiple frameworks and methodologies, methodologies and so on. Um, you know, coming from the agile space, it, there does tend to be this um, attitude of the one framework to rule them all, you know, there's the one playbook to implement and that's always made me feel a bit uncomfortable because it feels like um, it's, it eliminates so many possibilities because it's so constrained in its approach. So thank you. That was, that was really, really good. Very helpful. Thanks, Ed, for a wonderful question. Um, I'm cautious, Joan, Joan already uh, told us that she will have to leave in 10, in about 10 minutes. I don't know if that's still the case, Joan. I can stay till about 10 past now. Okay, I'll, that's wonderful. I'll let the others know um, I'll be a bit late. So. We'll, we'll, we'll take it, thank you. Um, so, um, Dave, if you don't mind, I know you asked a question. I, I wouldn't do it if you weren't uh, one of the hosts, but uh, Jean had a really, really good question. And speaking of help, I know you're disappointed. Do you mind if I bring Jean's questions first and then we'll move to yours? Yeah, I wouldn't do it if it was no, one of, of the participants, but um, of course. so uh, speaking of help, um, um, Ed, you said that was very helpful. And I think now I'm going to bring uh, Jean into the conversation. Um, welcome. Um, thanks for being here. Jean, maybe I, I'll just 
just stray away a little bit from from the uh, uh, the flow and would you like to just briefly introduce yourself um I, i'm not sure everyone in the i'm sure the panelist knows you very well but um not everyone just introduce yourself briefly and then um ask your question and become part of the conversation i'm 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 the black sheep of the systems family um <laughs> Oh, the question I posed was, what might be the benefit of removing help from your vocabulary? The reason for this, the question is, if I imply that I am here to help you, what's the implication I bring with me? I can jump in there. <laughs> yeah with a very brief thing um you're implying that they need help and first of all if you put that out there i know with my clients and with people who i work for if i kind of imply to them that they need help a barrier goes up a brick wall goes up um and so yeah i i see the the benefit of taking away that word help absolutely and reframing it to something else um, I think it does bring barriers up sometimes and and to an individual if somebody comes along and says do you need help with that or can I help you with that or can I do that for you it almost gives you a negative feeling yourself thinking oh somebody thinks I need help with that you know and you get that reaction to it and that's not the reaction that you want um, yeah so I can see the benefit of removing help from our vocabulary absolutely so what might be the alternative um sometimes i might ask do they need um or do they want a different perspective on anything do they want me to come in as a devil's advocate or anything like that so i'll ask them if they want a different uh perspective on it and sometimes uh, it doesn't even come through in the vocabulary that i use it might just be something that i do that that just exposes them to something very different and gets them curious um, so it's not necessarily about the words that I'm speaking, but the things that I'm doing sometimes. Um, mm. So something it might be, I might be an action that I take that just sparks their curiosity. And then I'll say something like, do you want to know a little bit more about that? Um, so it takes that kind of notion of help away sometimes. I think um, what I, I love the question. Um, I think it's, it's a great. beautiful question. and. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I think it's so important because I work a lot with role and I think what it does is the word help puts the person, either someone in the position of asking for help and gives someone else the role of helper um, and therefore puts someone else in the position of the one or the part of the system being helped. Um, but I'm wondering if instead of removing the word, the word kind of gets reframed and breaks that kind of circularity of someone else being the helper and puts the help role back on the individual um, so that you can be helpful in sort of helping people discover how they can take up their own role and rather than be dependent on or look externally um, for help so um, that might be another way in is instead of uh, replacing help or taking it away is is reframing what it means or what it looks like. Uh, well, the question reminded me yesterday afternoon, I picked up my three year old granddaughter from nursery and we went to a playground and uh, she started pulling herself up a climbing frame and got to a point where she was a bit stuck. So uh, I, I went up to her and in a very grandfatherly way, put my arm around her waist to just lift her up a little bit. And she screamed at me, don't help me. Because she wanted to do it herself, you know, she's, uh, you know, she's uh, really determined. And so I stepped back and she did it. And it's about power. I mean, helping is about power. It's about saying, I know better. I know more. I'm better. I'm more capable than you. And coming back to something that was discussed earlier is that um, I think one of the one of the other uh, questions related to um, uh, uh you know uh, you know the, the the feeling of not knowing about systems thinking is where do i start it's alibad point alibad made and i think you know sort of the, the thing about what i that i've learned about systems thinking is that while i've been studying it for 30 years i still feel like i'm a, i'm a learner i'm still 
you mm. know, trying to figure it all out, you know? And I feel very reluctant to actually say to somebody that I'm an expert about systems thinking um, because it's still a mystery to me. So I think to, you know, to, we can get rid of the, the help word by thinking about the co words, the, the, uh, the doing things together, the communicating, the cooperating, the collaborating, uh, the commiserating, you know, the, the words which about, you know, let's, let, let, let's, let's explore this situation together rather than I can help you because I'm the powerful, I'm the kind of, you know, I'm the, the guru on the subject. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And I, I think, Jane, I've spent um, the past five minutes looking at the, uh, the picture that's above my head on, on the screen, deliver happiness. And I think your question takes me to reflecting on the role of agency in systems work. And that's you know, in the systems that we support, but also as systems practitioners who are collaborating with people um, often from outside the systems that they are in. Um, and I, I think, you know, when I think this is meant to be a boardroom that we're sitting in or something like that, right? And deliver happiness reminds me of phrases like drive outcomes. And you don't drive outcomes, you drive cars or you drive sheep. Um, but, I, but I think that there's something here about um, what, what does it mean to work with people to help them? Again, what does, it, what does it mean to work with people and, and create the conditions in which people can think and work in systemic ways? Um, I think we can reframe some of that and question the role of agency in, in some of this stuff. I think removing it completely, um, you know, going to the polarity of it may not be the most helpful. I think reframing what help looks like and um, how that is you know, re, re kind of ignited, uh, I think would be probably something really important because I think there are times when um, members of a system or a system does get stuck and, um, you know, they are so immersed and in their own implicit meaning making and sense making and in their own patterning that they do need um, an intervention or a perturbation from the outside to help disrupt some of that. And I don't know if that is defined as help um, or how we would reframe that, but I think that is a form of help. And maybe there's a, you know, reconstituting of the relational power dynamic between help being helped and the helper. Um, but I think removing help completely um, in a kind of binary polarizing way, I don't know if that, I think there might be lighter ways to work with it rather than removing it. But, so just current kind of perspective hypothesis, I think. Wonderful. What a, what a rich conversation. Thanks, Jean, for asking. Would you like to contribute yourself? I, I just, the, the basis for posing the question is, if I come to you, who is likely to have a better understanding of what you're wrestling with, you or me? I'm the one that needs help to understand what you're wrestling with, as opposed to me helping. I mean, those, the, the reframing sounded real appropriate in terms of turning it around, all right? So that, that there's, there's, there's still help happening. It's just reframed in such a way that you don't put people off with it. So. So I appreciate the comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jean. Um, One of the things that I do often with leaders just um, is that uh, when they are um, being asked by someone, a colleague or a co another leader or a peer um, who's stuck with the problem and trying to solve something, I create a context where other leaders can be consultants to them, but they can't be helpful in the sense of give advice, tell them what to do, ask questions to get information for themselves so they can solve it, but they can ask questions with hypotheses which help the other person create new information for themselves and get different perspective. So that's the way I work with leaders to reframe what helpful looks like 
and redefine the role um, rather than solution giver, advisor, fixer on behalf of. Um, so that's a very practical way, I think, of working with it, Jean. Thank you. Um, Jean, as an honorary panelist, would you like to stay on the seat or you want to back to, um, to the outer circle? No, give it, give it to somebody else. Okay. By all means. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful question. Uh, and by the way, you know, the delivered happiness, I'm the same. Uh, look, the term deliver goes on my nerve. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to change it, but I get your point. Uh, very good point. Uh, so I, I think, Dave, probably coming back to your question, I'm going to bring you into the circle. And uh, yeah, take it away. And sorry, before I, you ask your question, Pauline, I really apologize. I, I don't know what is happening to the system. You keep disappearing and I need to keep bring you back in. Uh, it's a system error. I don't know what to do about it, but I appreciate your patience. Um, and, and, and I keep moving you around, yes, uh, <laughs> but I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. I quite like the move around. <laughs> <laughs> okay so, Dave, take it away thanks hopefully my um hopefully you guys can hear me okay uh, the sound's been coming in and out here a bit um my question was around um sort of look if you like the populist um systems thinking that we have i think systems dynamics quite often steals the show if you like um what i'd like to find out is like uh what are the the systems thinking schools or areas or even methods that you guys use that you think are undervalued or underutilized uh, by a lot of people. Maybe, maybe it's like almost asking you your, your secret weapon that you, you bring out when nobody's looking at. I'm not sure. Yeah, if I might just sort of just barge in here, I think there's a kind of uh, being sort of the northern hemispherist. I think there's a kind of a split between uh, across the Atlantic here. I think there's a uh, the North American. School of Systems Thinking often seems to be heavily influenced by uh, our old mate Peter Senge and the 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 uh, the long lasting influence of the fifth discipline. Um, so whenever I talk to uh, whenever it sounds like every time, but often when I talk to Americans about systems thinking, they they, they use the word leverage or leverage uh, and. Uh, you know, which is a very system dynamics perspective on systems thinking. You're looking for a point where you can actually stick something in and make it better. Um, I think on the 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 eastern side of the Atlantic, the the sort of the European school is more influenced by um, alternative ideas. So, I, for example, you know, I think something like you know, it's an entry for for Pauline and and the viable system model which you know is a very kind of sort of british sort of thing with the stafford beer uh the the critical school which is influenced by german critical philosophy so there's there, there are other ideas which i think are not necessarily as well known on the this side of the atlantic but which uh, are you know really powerful so for example my own secret weapon i'll sort of pull that one out of my pocket here is critical systems heuristics which um for quite a long time i couldn't make head no tail of it i couldn't figure it out at all but then suddenly something clicked and i realized actually it's an incredibly powerful tool in my particular sphere which is uh about uh developing learning and development policies because that is all about boundary judgments it's all about making decisions about who is involved who is not involved what do they need to know? What do they not need to know? How are they going to learn about this? How are they not going to learn about this? And these are all things where we have to make a decision about, you know, sort of what is in and what is out of the system. So that was my two penny worth. I can come in on the back of that because I think it kind of links to what Brian was saying. Anybody who knows me and knows my work will know that I work really heavily with the viable system model. And I think that's highly underutilized because I think it's highly, highly versatile and much more versatile than people give it credit for. 
so when I first came across it, I thought it looked hard, it looked technical, it looked, you know, very hard systems. I thought it was just all about information and communication. And that was my first impression of it. But actually, I've used it now for in excess of 20 years, done lots of work with it. And what I started to do many, many years ago, it must be in excess of 10 years ago, I started to turn it into, so what does the human do when they actually do that bit of the viable system? So when I thought I was using the viable system model out in the projects and programs that I was working on, when I thought I was putting it into practice, what was it that people were doing right then? And what was it that worked and what didn't work? And from that, I've kind of flipped that round to every single bit of the viable system model. So what does the human do at that singular point in time? What is it that they're doing to make that bit of the model work? And that's what I use now. And that's how I developed, as you know, Dave, you've seen the, seen the kit that I've got, the Creating the Conditions for Change kit is actually the viable system model, but related to what human beings do. And, and actually that creates the conditions for change because I realized that that's what I was doing. I wasn't focusing on doing an improvement or telling people what to do. I was helping them to create the right conditions that would build relationships, that would make information be, be shareable, that I was doing all of that kind of thing. And that was a real revelation. It wasn't what I wanted to find. You know, when I started to use the viable system model, I wanted to use this really hard technical model. And then I thought, hang on a minute, this is far more human than, than what you think. And that, that's how I've developed all of that kit. And one thing that really sparked that was when I did a course with the Open University in 2011, and they taught us how to use the viable system model on ourselves for our own personal development. And I did that and I've used it ever since. Every year since I do a viable system model of me, how I'm me, how I'm um, building up my business, am I, what's my kind of identity, what's the business's identity, how does that fit, how does it not fit, what do I do as a person? And because I was able to do that on me, I was able then to help teams understand how they do it for a team and then how they do it for a department and then how you look at the organization like that. And that's how I teach people how to use the viable system model. I start with the individual, then we move to every single scale above that. So I've been doing that for many, many years now. Um, and I think it's just a highly un underutilized model because I've seen what it can do. I was gonna say, Dave, you're trying to get me in trouble again by making me say something mean about systems dynamics. Um, but you I think it's saying that in front of Gene, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it wasn't it really wasn't my really wasn't my intent to beat up on systems dynamics. I, I think it, uh, I think it's an important sort of space in systems thinking, but only one space. Yeah, and I think I think it is an interesting. I mean, Brian's comments about the different cultures on the two sides of the Atlantic. I think there are some interesting reflections on the predominant systems thinking culture here in Australia as well. And I would say it is probably more influenced by the American school and the lingering effects of systems dynamics in the fifth discipline than it is by some of the more human approaches. Um, I think one of the distinctions that I've started to make in my work, and Joan, it connects to something you said earlier as well, I think there's systems work that is quite technical in nature. And then there is kind of an emerging adaptive systems practice. Um, I think that, you know, that's about um, bringing reflective inquiry into the work of, of systems thinking, um, thinking through the human dimensions um, and holding multiple perspectives in the work. Um, yeah. So I think like, there's, there is work in the Australian context to, to cultivate, I think, those other ways of, of thinking through systems. The final thing I'd do is, is give another plug to critical systems heuristics. It's something that I return to very often in my work. Um, and I've, I've found it particularly useful in public sector contexts here in Australia. Yeah. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, John. Um, um, would you like to have any closing comments? What I also do is I'll stop this immersive view 
So maybe we can see everyone now, now that we know each other and know how the panels are. Mm. Oh, that feels uh, liberating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let us feel better. Um, uh, yeah, maybe before I step out, I, um, I'm actually going to a group that I work with um, on, they are all warm data hosts uh, trained by Nora, and we've got a group looking at organizational systems and the application of warm data in that. So that's where I'm jumping to. So I'm torn because I think I love this conversation. Really, really interesting. I, I think that, um, you know, and what's why I'm making this point is, you know, warm data is a kind of emergent idea really at the opposite end of the spectrum to system dynamics around how you make sense of cross uh, contextual thinking within um, systems and, you know, is that applicable to organizations uh, and it would really be in a quite a different paradigm to the system dynamics. Uh, paradigm. I, I, what I find most helpful is rather than models is frameworks that are heuristic based and principle based, you know, critical systems heuristics, but also um, ones that come out of, I use a lot, come out of family systems. Not that family systems are the same as organizational systems. Obviously, the um, form of them is very different because the the um, roles that people get to occupy are a lot less permanent, which redefines a, a, an organizational system from a family one. But I think there are a lot of principles that we can help people explore around how complex systems work and how to see themselves in role in system and how co-creation and circularity and interdependence occurs in a, in a patterned way. So I love the idea of bringing certain heuristics like the boundaries, like relational thinking, um, like pattern thinking. To me, the idea that Richard Capra raises around an understanding of life begins with an understanding of pattern and that we don't start with a methodology, but we help a system discover the pattern of relations that they are co-creating for themselves, not in a bad way, um, but just how it is with neutrality. Some of those principles I find are very, very helpful for making what has become invisible to a system more visible. And, um, I, you know, those are, I think, what are some of the scaffolds that I would really, you know, recommend using um, as an alternative to the very kind of structured idea of you know feedback loop mapping etc um so yeah just some other thoughts ways in looking at role looking at role relations pattern um, boundaries where those are being held one of the distinctions i'm working with a lot now which i think is uh, i'd love to have a conversation about maybe it's a, a systems at play conversation next time but is, is there a distinction and what is the distinction between working with complex problems in complex domains versus helping, um, there's that word again, helping us understand how we function as complex systems in organizations. And, you know, I hear a lot about the solutions in the complexity space around how do we help people experiment ways forward discover um, you know solutions into complex problems but i don't think we have a lot of methodology which helps us see ourselves as complex systems and i think that is something quite distinctive and i, I would love for us to explore those you know what is the difference between those two things and how do they connect um, so maybe i'll leave that as a provocation before i uh, head off Thank you so much uh, for joining. Really appreciate taking the time. Um, equally, I think we've gone up past one one hour. I, I, I appreciate everyone joining. I, I will be here for another whatever number of hours that we need to. Um, so if you like to drop off, please feel free. But um, we are still around. So if you can stay, that would be wonderful. Uh, thanks, John. Um, Thank you. For thanks for having me. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Such a good conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Bye, nice to Hi, John. How are you? So, if if anyone wants to drop off, please. Um,
don't hesitate but i rather prefer if you don't but uh <laughs> but let's just continue um i don't know if i'm pronouncing your name correctly piot um i don't know is that the right pronunciation okay so you had a good point about uh, help did you want to talk about that or would you like to continue that this um, same conversation um i can certainly comment or spend all my comment and chat. I really like the way uh, John responded to uh, Jean's question. Um, so I think uh, the, the way that I have suggested is, is only just one, but uh, I do believe there is there are a different, different alternatives for basically turning this around. And, I, and <clears throat> this actually, ties very nicely to what uh, Joan said uh, just before she left, uh, which is um, how do we go about um, making the system which we are part of visible to itself, right? Uh, so one, one of, one of the, the, uh, the works that I have been following is by uh, Otto Scharmer, um, certainly you, you have Heard the name, and so he he, he is um, helping this this word again, uh, all of us uh, to develop some capacity. Um, and this this very nice picture uh, of the scientist uh, astronomer uh, first looking at the at the sky, uh, trying to look at the the sky uh, with all the planets and uh, and stars. And then he bends the telescope. Uh, just so the telescope is, is, is then facing the scientist, right? So, but of course, this is just, 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 just one image. But with this um, theory view that he has developed and he's been promoting very heavily in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, that's one, one, of, one of the methods that I come across, which is very helpful uh, with uh, discovering and getting a better understanding of the system which we inherently are part of. Thank you, that's uh, such a good point. And um, it actually ties nicely into my question. I've heard a lot that as a coach uh, or a consultant, mostly coach, you need to always keep a objective distance to the people and the system that you're coaching so you can help them or contribute to them. Uh, Gene, I think you broke me. Uh, I can't uh, use that <laughs> word anymore. So well done. But I think you've changed all of us forever. Um, that's the uh, importance of the good question. So yeah, I think I've heard that term a lot too. As a coach or system practitioner, you have to keep an objective distance. And I used to believe in that, but now I'm not very sure. And I think, Pietro, your point is, um, is, is quite important. I, I'm not sure if that's actually correct to have that objective distance. I, mean, I don't know even what that means now. Anyone have any, any view on that? I don't think there's any I'll such thing as objectivity. I think everything we look at comes through, you know, our, uh, our, our own particular lenses. And so everything is subjective. Mm. Yeah. It's all down to our own biases, our you know, our perspectives, our experiences, all that sort of thing. So yeah, there is objective reality. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe for the closing, Jean, um, did you did you did you like to would you like to just quickly share your um oh sorry? Uh, look okay, look at the drop offs. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to say goodbye, but uh, we'll make up, make it up to him later. Jean, did you want to just briefly talk about um, um, the the new? I think there was a new website that recently uh, you launched a new a new system. Well, it's uh, it's it's not a website. It's the beginning of October. Well, the systems thinking systems thinking no systemswiki.org website, which I maintained for about ten years evaporated a couple of years ago, which was probably a good thing. Um, though I've so I spent the last couple of years trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I didn't want another wiki. And then all of a sudden, on the beginning of October, 
actually thanks to Luke a lot. I connected with Substack and I started writing very short articles, musings that you know are a page or a page and a half with an associated video that that unfolds a, a relationship model to tell a story. So I just posted a link to um, I think in the last six weeks I've written written twenty three articles. So I publish on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. So again, I'm conscious of the time. Before anyone drops, I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, this was a wonderful... I, I feel I have to go back and watch this um, again and again several times. There were so many insights in, in, in the conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, any closing comments? Uh, if yeah, our panelists would like to... Yeah, please. Um, I also posted a link to uh, calendly.com. Anybody wants to have a chat, just schedule a session on my calendar. We will take your offer on that, certainly. Thank you. Any Thank any you. closing comments from Brian, Pauline? Uh, no, it's been a great morning. It's, um, yeah, actually I kind of started off and it was dark and uh, now I finished off and the sun has risen and uh, it feels like this happened in my brain as well as a result of this conversation. Very yeah, nice. I, can, I can kind of mirror that, Brian. It's a little bit the same for me. We started off in the dark at 6.30 in the morning and now, <laughs> now the sun's out and it's woken me up for the day. But it, it's really nice to actually engage in some of the conversation and, and bash out some of these things in a really positive way. Um, and I think that's what I've really enjoyed about the session. You know, there was some really good stories and yet it, it's been a very, very positive session. So thanks to everyone for, for their input. Thanks, Brian. Dean yeah. said it's 3.30 a.m. there, so. <laughs> Get a good night's sleep, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I will be staying around, but um, you don't have to. And thanks also for the participants for staying with us. Thanks, everyone. It was really yes. good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. See you. Okay, guys. I know. I know. I, I, oh, we have to still pull in here. So there you go. Ask your way. <laughs> yeah. And Brian. Too. And Brian. Yeah, I'm going to have to go in. Okay. But I just wanted to say, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's been an interesting morning. It's well worth getting up in the dark. Thank you. So. <laughs>